A war is many things at once. It is a humanitarian tragedy, it is a strategic maneuver, an economic crisis and a political statement, which is why reporting a war is so difficult. You cannot just focus on one part of it. You must focus on everything, the cause, the politics, the objectives, the finances. All of it put together gives you the full picture. Here at Vion, we've done that. Even before the first shot was fired, we visited Ukraine, we met the locals, we talked to the experts, we visited the training fields. At that point, war was not a certainty. Yes, Ukraine was preparing for the worst, but they had not given up hope. There was an outside chance that peace would prevail. As you can see, uh, the reserve forces are getting ready. They're picking up the weapons here. This is how it's going to look. 17,000 foreigners from all parts of the world have come and joined this force. To my right is Belarus, to my left is Russia, and in front of me is Ukraine. Honestly, it's jarring to watch it again. Those snowy locations are now the front lines of the war. Those soldiers are perhaps in the trenches. And those bomb shelters. Maybe frightened families used them in the early days of the war. Like I said, all of it is jarring. Those reports were from the first and second week of February. Around 14 days before Putin invaded, throughout that time, we dis dissected the looming war. We told you why Putin was obsessed with Ukraine, why the war may not go to plan, and how NATO sold fake dreams to Ukraine, which is quite different from the Western perspective. The CNNs and the BBCs of the world made up their mind. This would be a fight between good and evil. The democratic world on one side, Putin and his autocratic regime on the other. In other words, they picked a side. And don't get us wrong here, Russia is clearly the aggressor in this war. You cannot justify their invasion of Ukraine. We did not either. Instead, we tried to make sense of it. We tried to tell you why Putin invaded, why the NATO led Ukraine on. Answering those questions is key to war reporting. It's not just battlefield strategies or frontline casualties. It's also about the political calculations behind the war. Not everyone liked when we reported that. Earlier this week, they blocked our channel on the 22nd of March. No new uploads, no videos, a total block. We simply broadcast the Russian foreign minister's statement, just like we broadcast the Ukrainian minister's statement. We do not believe in censorship. We do not believe in telling half the story. Apparently, that's what YouTube wants. That is another aspect of this war. Technology is completely on Ukraine's side. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all over social media, support poured in for Ukraine and credit to them. President Zelensky turned out to be a social media whisperer. His selfie videos went viral immediately. Around the same time, we began our second reporting assignment in Ukraine. Our Pakistan bureau chief was on the job. He traveled to three major Ukrainian cities, Lviv in the west, Kiev in the capital, the capital of course, and Irpin in the north. Remember, this was early March. Russia was making swift territorial gains around that time. Their soldiers had reached the outskirts of Kiev. Many expected the capital to fall any day. Uh, there's a probably you can hear that's uh, shelling being done right now. We're seeing people are emotional leaving their houses. The situation here is pretty grim. The railway station is almost empty. I'm currently in Bukha and this was the bridge that used to connect Irpin to Bukha. I'm at the Shemishil train station which is serving as a connectivity a route for the people of Ukraine. Six months later, Kiev stands strong. Today, there were muted Independence Day celebrations. President Zelensky and the First Lady attended a prayer at the St. Sophia Cathedral. They also paid tribute to fallen soldiers at the Golden Domed Monastery. It was indeed a moving occasion, a reminder of Ukraine's resolve and courage. But as journalists, we cannot get carried away with emotions. We must deal with the cold realities, like the rising cost of oil, or the endless supply of Western weapons, or India's position of neutrality. And that last one has been debated a lot. Western media sees India's neutrality as lacking principle, as tacit, tacit support for Vladimir Putin. But we've repeatedly explained the strategy behind it. India has historic relations with Russia. It is not something that can be sacrificed overnight. And it really comes down to nuances. 
Western media analyzes this war with broad strokes, something we've tried to avoid because every conflict is influenced by history, culture and sometimes race. This one in Ukraine is no different. You may have seen reports of European countries welcoming refugees with the red carpet. But that is just one side of the story. Those same countries also blocked the entry of black people from Ukraine. We see the plight of the Ukrainian people and we have reported on their hardships. But what about the Western media? They only see race. The color of your skin, the color of your hair. European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed. These are not refugees from Syria. You know, like Iraq or Afghanistan, this is a relatively civilized. Ukraine does not deserve war or hardships because Ukraine is civilized. Well, this is what systemic racism looks like. Looking back, how would we describe our six months of reportage? Probably holistic. We reported from the battlefield, dissected the diplomacy and analyzed the strategy. All of this without picking sides. It's easy to get carried away in narratives of good versus evil or invader versus invaded, but conflicts are not so black and white. Here at Weon, we've stuck to facts and discussed the real politic. We've seen this war for what it really is, a needless conflict triggered by world powers, and Ukraine is the chess piece doing all the fighting. Weon is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.